Hello everyone, welcome back to another episode of the Hello Cannot podcast. I'm your host Kevin Chong and today I would just like to share a bit on my experience in terms of baking and how you know my wife suffered because of this uh, fancy hobby of mine. Okay, Alright, so historically baking has been my weakness. You know my entire life I've only baked once and that happened when I was in university. So today I'd like to just share on the experience on baking, why I do not bake often, and how baking actually affected the people around me, especially my wife. Okay, so in the first 18 years of my life, you know, I've gone as far, only as far as cooking fried rice, Maggi Mee, stir fries and vegetables, you know, but all of this was done without any supervision. So needless to say, the results were manageable for my standards. I have very, very low standards in terms of uh, my own food, right? And I did no, I did not cause any harm to my body. So I barely had diarrhea. I did not suffer from stomach cramps and stuff like that. Um, but for cases when I was under supervision, right? So like when my mom, typical Asian moms, they like to monitor when you're cooking. So with my mom around, you know, I was I assumed the role of more like a mindless chef, a mindless drone, right? So I never really spend time to understand why my mom would choose certain type of sauces you know and even flavoring why do we need to add it and how long do i need to cook it for or how much i need to add so there was never a time you know where i wanted to i was fascinated by this uh cooking hobby and i never explored further into baking so after that you know after 18 years uh spent in malaysia i actually spent three years uh studying for my bachelor's degree in australia so I was staying in this on-campus hostel. Food is not catered for in this place, right? So what they did was they offered us a centralized kitchen. So for all of the residents here, you know, close to about 500 residents, uh, this centralized kitchen is actually as big as a basketball court. So it's able to accommodate uh, all of us, you know, cooking, especially during the peak hours. So this kitchen actually was quite substantially uh, prepared, right? In the sense that it came with gas stoves, it came, it came with fridges, freezers, you know, and even ovens at the edge of uh, each cooking area. So if, if any of you have ever lived in, you know, maybe in a Western country or even Australia, you find out that cooking for yourself as a student is actually much more affordable than eating out. So, you know, I was still a young student or young kid in that sense. I was still learning and developing my cooking skills, right? But I did try, I, I, most, on the, most days, I actually tried cooking on a daily basis, right? And I was started trying out much more complex recipes. So I tried to make curry, uh, soy sauce, chicken, uh, steak, you know, stuff like that. And I was actually comfortable, you know, admitting that, um, I'm actually comfortable admitting that I screwed up during my first few days uh, in Australia. So food was mostly undercooked. I gave myself diarrhea, you know, I've been to the toilet time after time. Uh, and I did learn my lesson, but also not in the right way. I overcooked the, all my food for the next few weeks, right? So because you undercook, you're definitely going to overcook to compensate for your food. So that will ensure that my stomach or my bowels will enjoy a much happier time processing food uh, during after the whole diarrhea phase. Yep, so I learned my lesson. Uh, slowly, you know, I improved. I started fine-tuning to get a more acceptable range of edible food. You know, so eventually, uh, as a Malaysian, I learned how to cook bakute, hainan chicken rice, rendang chicken and beef. And just probably a small secret for everyone, uh, bakute, if it's kept overnight, it brings out the strongest flavor in the soup. So I recommend if you're ever planning to eat, let's say, on uh, Monday, please cook it on Sunday, store it in the fridge, leave it overnight, and I assure you Monday is going to be the best tasting soup you ever have. Um, but whether you're going to store it for more than a day, that is up to you. I'm just saying at least give it one overnight uh, rest in the fridge. Okay, so um, I knew I was cooking well enough, right? So when I was confident in cooking bigger portions, I was ready to start sharing my food with international friends and Singaporean friends. Why I mention Singaporean friends aside, uh, special, especially is because, um, so in comparing to my Malaysian friends, right, if I'm ever cooking a dish 
I am only ready to share it with them when I know it's the best, best dish that I could have produced, right? Because uh, let me just share with you a known secret. Um, where, when I was studying, we actually have uh, like two groups of people, like one group where the Singaporeans hang out together and the second one is where the group of Malaysians actually hang out to, hung out together as well. But every, each of the groups are responsible for their own cooking and food, right? So obviously, uh, the food cooked by Malaysians is always better, uh, and it really is really, really tasty. So there's a different set of standards for Malaysians, right? So I can imagine why when I shared this with my international friends and probably even my Singaporean friends, uh, they were much easier in accepting the dishes that I've made. But if I were to share with my Malaysian friends, I'm going to get criticized so much. Right. So in university, uh, cooking is like a form of survival for me. And baking is more of like an interest, a hobby, right? So you don't really need to bake to survive. Uh, and what I would rather much rather spend time, you know, required for baking, you know, or working on my assignments, studying, or even gaming, like the nerd that I was. So why waste time? Baking takes takes up so much of your time, you need to make the batter, you need to mix the cream, the dough, and you need to put it in the oven and give it some time to cook, right? And then uh, you have the bakers, right? These are our all-purpose flour addicts. They are consumer of eggs, they are expert in potion mixtures, they are basically the permanent occupants of the ovens, right? So all of the ovens are constantly running close to 24-7, and these bakers are constantly having their, uh, I would say, cakes, uh, cookies mixed and shoved into the ovens. Okay, so these baking wizards, you know, as I would like to call them, are a very interesting bunch. They're so passionate enough towards pastry and cookies, you know, cakes and tarts. The kitchen always smells good because of them, but it's it's always a dirty mess as well because of them. So it's almost you know as, as if making a mess is part of baking. There's always flour, sugar, salt all over the table. So if, but you know, in Asian families, right? If you ever make a mess at home and you don't clean it up, you will. I'm pretty sure that I would have been punished or I'll get disowned. Okay. And actually, while we're on that topic, let me just share a bit in terms of a, a, a very funny experience that I had when I was still in Australia. So here you have. Uh, bakers, right? They are baking sweet food. They love uh, cookies, they love tarts, they love cakes. The whole kitchen smells amazing for them. But for Malaysians, I have a very interesting story. Uh, this happened quite some time before. Um, I was basically walking back to the kitchen to get some lunch. I think it was lunch. Um, so I wanted to walk into the kitchen. Uh, it's a it was quite a long walk uh, from campus to my residential hall, uh, but as soon as I got near the central kitchen, I saw a lot of uh, how is it Angmos or you know Caucasians started fleeing the central kitchen. There was no alarms, no rings, which means that it wasn't a fire. But yet everyone was seemed like they were trying to escape from the centralized kitchen. So that was something uh, awkward that I felt. You know, like it's not a common situation where everyone does this. So um, two things happened, right? As people were fleeing the uh, fleeing the centralized kitchen, all of the Caucasians were yelling, "Oh, that's some smelly shit!" You know, let's get out of here. I cannot spend a minute more in the kitchen. And what I heard from the other end of the spectrum is basically we have Malaysians and Singaporeans. It's like, dude, that smells good. Let's go and see what it is. <laughs> You know, and basically, I walked into the centralized kitchen. The minute I smelt the air, god damn it, it's sambal belacan. <laughs> and sambal is basically like a very um, spicy chili dish uh, which uses uh, the prawn shells, you know, and it gives that kind of uh, smelly aroma for Caucasians. It's not something that they normally smell, it's like giving them durian. Uh, but for us Malaysians uh, and Singaporeans, perhaps it's a very common dish uh, that we use to fry maybe uh, rice, you know, or even add into our dishes to make it smell better. So there are a lot of uses for this uh, sambal balachan, but this is definitely not something that, uh, that Caucasians can handle on a long-term basis. 
So that was one of a very interesting, uh, interesting experience that I had. And after that, uh, there was a notice saying that Malaysians and Singaporeans or anyone else, you know, are banned from cooking dishes that have a very, very distinct aroma. And I like how they would use the word distinct. Basically, it means smelly. Right. Okay. So <laughs> back to the original topic, right? Uh, I was talking about baking, right? And how you would make a mess. And if I were to make a mess at home, I would basically get punished or disowned. But you know, I then I remembered, hey, I'm actually quite far away from home. It's a eight hours flight. There's no real consequences for me, right? Making a mess. So I, I, I tried to give myself some courage you know I started looking up some of the simplest of recipes but you know sometimes when you're looking into experimenting something new uh, you're not sure if it's something that you will do long term so basically as uh, any poor people would do they would spend the least amount of money to pay for something cheap equipments right for this instance to say hey let me try this out with the cheapest version of, uh, of equipment that I can use and if it turns out well and I want to pursue this further, I will pay more and spend more for better equipment, right? So uh, I found out that actually the easiest uh, baking recipe or actually the product would have been cupcakes. I had basically had everything else. Uh, I mean, uh, consumables like flour, like eggs, is something that you can constantly use. It's fine. But if you were to buy the mold for, let's say, cupcakes, you know, to buy... Uh, the mixers and stuff like that it will cost a quite a significant amount of money and that's not something that i was willing to spend yet so i got my cupcake shells i chucked all my batter into them and i put them into the preheated oven and i sat there and started chatting with my friends right so uh, what happened was uh, after about 30 minutes i noticed something smelled off and i just took a quick look into the oven the cupcakes did not turn out well so uh, I should not have placed all my eggs in one basket. Get the pun? <laughs> so I, I found out later, you know, that uh, what happened was uh, the oven, uh, the centralized kitchen ovens do not have uh, even heating, right? So basically the heating starts around the corners of the oven like most ovens do, but there's no heating at the top. So what, hap uh, so what caused the cupcakes to fail is because of this uneven heating. The cupcakes around the center of the mold were still moist, right? They were not cooked well enough. But the cupcakes, you know, that were situated, uh, seated towards the edge of the mold, they were smoking black. They've already gone black and burnt. So, you know, I did not really question further. I, I just said, hey, I've already spent my money on these cupcakes. Let me just eat them and see how it goes. And by God, was it a big <laughs> freaking disappointment. Uh, it tasted horrible and hard, on, especially on those that, the parts that were burnt. You know, if I, I, would, I told my friends, you know, like the cupcakes that I made, Frodo could have gone to Molo once more, chucked my cupcakes into the fire, and only then will my cupcakes disintegrate. So I must say, uh, I did use the, I, I'm a common user of the oven. You know, uh, the oven can actually be even used for chicken, pork, or even kangaroo. Yes, kangaroo. So um, for those of you who are not aware, uh, in Australia, kangaroos are considered a pest, right? There's too many of them, and uh, Australians actually do need help to get rid of them. So you think they're furry, they're cute, you know, and they're lazy, uh, but even worse, they have this status as a pest, right? And because of their number of uh, kangaroos around, uh, it's actually very dangerous driving uh, at night because whenever they see, uh, you know, like a flashing light, they'll be curious. They'll jump right into the middle of the road, which will, you know, like an oncoming car will definitely whack into them. And worst case scenario, the kangaroo dies and the car gets wrecked and everyone inside the car dies, right? It's, a, it's not a common thing that happens across Australia but it's known that it does happen so right kangaroos are horrible pests right so because they're abundant uh, in terms of uh, the source of this meat kind of meat uh, they're easily one of the cheapest meat around right 
but actually they're a bit tougher, a bit bloodier than steak. So imagine if you're cooking uh, time-wise time, time wise or even uh, preparation-wise, you're cooking for a medium-rare steak. If you use the same timing for, let's say, a kangaroo, instead of medium-rare, you basically get rare. So you need to up the time uh, like by, by one category above, right? And also, uh, I would say if, if you're a first-time person trying kangaroo, it's a very much acquired taste, right? It's not some, it's like durian. Um, the first time you have it, uh, it's not really easy to accept it, but once you have it often enough, it actually becomes a very common uh, taste, uh, taste in your mouth. And from time to time, you will still look for it uh, in getting some kangaroo meat and cooking them. Okay. All right, back to my cupcakes. <laughs> and because of that one incident where I attempted to bake cupcakes, it failed, you know, and I, that was basically the end of my baking journey. You know, and each time if I tell myself, hey, uh, should I bake again? You know, my brain reminds me, hello, cannot. Remember what happened? You know, and I just lose all confidence uh, and courage to just bake. Right. And also just for everyone's uh, uh, reminders, sort of information as well, FYI, um, it's a centralized kitchen. There are no barriers. Uh, everyone can see what everyone else is doing. And if you mess up a batch of baking goods or even if you fry something wrong or if there are any problems with how you cook a certain thing, everyone knows. And I, as a typical Asian, I do not want to be known for my horrible baking skills. Yeah. So, you know, after all these years, right, I'm 29 years old now. I have left uni for six years. Uh, wait, let me just count that right. No, eight years since I graduated at the age of 21. I have always found myself wanting redemption, right? To prove that if I can master and learn a new language, I actually spent some money to learn Japanese and I did. I mean, I did actually pick up well enough. Uh, and if I could learn a new language, if I could work out my taxes, what is baking, right? Baking seems like everyone can do it. It seems easy, uh, much more achievable than, you know, even doing your own tax. And, you know, I, I always have this issue where if I'm thinking about something, I would bring it up multiple times to my wife. I would say, hey, um, mom. I was actually planning on doing this, uh, I'm thinking of doing it this weekend, baking, and I never got around, like, I keep sharing that idea with my wife, but there was never a proper time where I would say, hey, let's go get the ingredients this weekend, we're going to make this cake, right, or cookie. So it's been a year or so before I actually landed on a decision on the right recipe, and I actually bought the ingredients required. So I actually decided uh, after a year of bugging my wife that I would make burnt cheesecake, right? So burnt cheesecake, uh, hopefully everyone is aware, is actually quite a very popular dessert in Malaysia. Uh, and just to share with you, to bake a burnt cheesecake, it contains very few ingredients and there's very minimal instructions, right? So I used this opportunity to try my baking skills once more. Okay, and you know, throughout the baking process, uh, my wife was sort of my assistant, or in this case, like my mom, <laughs> supervising me, making sure that uh, the way I, I, I follow the instructions, you know, I put in the right ingredients at the right time. So as I started preparing my batter, so my old habit, I have this very bad habit of customizing recipes, right? So even if I'm cooking, Let's say if uh, a vegetable, stir frying a vegetable requires a pinch of salt, I would go with two or maybe one and a half, right? Because I feel that maybe uh, the taste would be better with one and a half, you know, and I would uh, consume more salt in my life that would kill me. But I'm perfectly fine with just adding a little bit more salt. And that's not something that you do with baking, right? Baking, you should actually follow right down to as, pos as much as possible to the uh, to the recipe, how many grams is required, how many cups, how many uh, handful of maybe let's say salt or even flour, right? So let's say uh, the 
burnt cheesecake recipe required like 400 grams of cream cheese. And you know what bothers me a lot is that when you go to the groceries, they actually sell this standard cream cheese block of like 226 grams, right? So if it was 200 grams, I just needed to buy two blocks, chuck the whole thing in and I will be good. But no, they had to be, they had to make it at 26 grams extra. Like who in their freaking mind decided, hey, let's screw up everyone else. Let's just have that additional 26 grams so that no one can actually throw the whole chunk of cream cheese into whatever mixture they have. So to fulfill the 400 grams of cream cheese, I basically had to have two blocks, right? Two blocks which uh, amounted to close to, let's say, uh, 450 grams, right? And, and the thing with cream cheese is I can't be bothered, you know, I'm, I'm lazy to cut, you know, and to weigh, make sure, making sure it's 400 grams. So my standard customization of recipe, I just opened up the both blocks and I just threw it directly into the, uh, to the mixture bowl, right? And my wife started uh, yelling and saying, hey, dude, you cannot do this. You need to follow the instructions. So in my head, I heard, hello, cannot. Follow instructions that way, you know. <laughs> and happy wife, happy life. You need to always remember that. So keeping that in mind, I removed the additional 50 grams of cream cheese. I started to stick to the exact proportions right required for each ingredient. I mixed the batter, you know, I poured it into the spring pan, shoved it into the oven. So, you know, the preheated oven, I just let it bake for about 45 minutes. And I look back at the kitchen top, right? So after doing all of this uh, cooking, mixing of batter, my kitchen top was a mess. But hey, based on my experience in Australia, this is usually, usually a very good sign, which means that whatever I'm baking should turn out well. So that was how I tried to comfort myself, you know, at ease on my anxiety as, you know, the baking time counted down. Uh, who knew, you know, after 45 minutes, my cheesecake came out amazingly. It was actually well baked. Uh, the texture was soft and creamy, you know, and it just, the cheesecake just melts in the mouth, right? And I was like, I've done it. I'm so proud of myself. I was so confident that uh, this cheesecake was good enough uh, to be shared with my friends and family who had nothing but praises, right? So imagine like you're going out to a restaurant uh, and you're ordering cheesecake. This cheesecake can easily top that in terms of uh, taste-wise or even the flavor, right? So uh, I was riding high on this dopamine. I was like, hmm, so I can actually do this baking shit. Uh, it's not too hard. And I felt like I already ascended, I've already ascended into a certified baker status, you know, like a wizard, a master of cheesecake arts. So... You know, whenever you think you're good enough, you're ready for the next challenge, and so was I. And, you know, my wife, actually, uh, she's a very big fan of burnt cheesecakes, but more so than burnt cheesecakes, she loves tiramisu. So happy wife, happy life, always remember that. I decided to try making uh, tiramisu. So this is tiramisu, the one with alcohol in it, not like the tiramisu cakes that you find, you know, in uh, certain shops where... You, they give you uh, nuts and berries on top. Okay, so I did my research. I found out which was the best uh, tiramisu to make. It was perfect. It seemed easy. I got this. I told myself I was ready. And for anyone who has not made tiramisu before, you know, there are two ingredients that exist for the sole purpose of tiramisu. Like these two ingredients, through my eyes, was created perfectly. Uh, by this person for tiramisu and it seems like this person is just monopolizing the entire market because of these two freaking ingredients number one your lady fingers biscuit this biscuit i'm not sure how or uh, how people can use it in any other food but for uh, tiramisu is the perfect ingredient that is able to absorb the coffee and alcohol and still retain uh, the sort of the texture within it Right? And then the second thing would be mascarpone. I have no idea what this mascarpone is. It's a type of uh, cream milk cheese product, byproduct. 
uh, dairy product, in fact, and it's the only thing that is required. I mean, for tiramisu, it's one of the main ingredients required. So, Ladyfingers, biscuit, and mascarpone. They're not cheap as well. Like, just getting these two would cost about 35 ringgit Malaysia just to make your one to one and a half batches of tiramisu. Okay? So, to summarize the production of tiramisu, um, there are a few things that you need. You need your cream batter. You need to soak your biscuits in coffee and alcohol. Alcohol is optional. You need to arrange them in a container, you need to lay out the cream evenly and then you just need to repeat until you have at least two layers for tiramisu. For those of you who don't really know what tiramisu looks like, please google them. Um, making tiramisu was a, needed more effort compared to burnt cheesecake, right? So we made a mess during the entire process. Uh, still a good sign in my book, right? Remember, if it's a mess, it usually turns out amazing. Uh, we made our own version, you know, of the non-alcoholic tiramisu. We locked them inside containers and we just left them in the fridge overnight. So it was the first thing, you know, that the next day waking up, we needed to check. It was on top of our priority. Uh, we went to the fridge and we took a look, opened up uh, the containers, right? And unfortunately, the cream mixture did not become thicker. Uh, it was quite soggy. So imagine like stir-frying vegetables and realizing your vegetables are too soggy. So that was the exact same issue with our tiramisu. My, my wife was brave enough, right? She took a spoon, she started digging into the tiramisu, you know, with intent to eat it. Uh, and after a few spoonful, she concluded, you know, that the taste was at least there, uh, giving me some form of relief. You know, at least it wasn't a total failure. It still tasted like tiramisu. So that was a good sign, or so I thought. Right, so after an hour, uh, my wife actually experienced mild diarrhea. So I uh, just explained a bit, right? Uh, I'm not a fan of eating desserts so early in the morning, so that's why my wife had it and I did not. And when my wife said that it was taste, it tasted well. I was expecting to have it after dinner, so that would be that would complement my dinner and have a good ending to my night, right? That would be a awesome ending, actually. But since she had her diarrhea issue, so I did not uh, consume it after it anymore. So, you know, my wife, she actually experienced some difficulties in the bathroom. Served as, you know, it was a very valuable warning for me. I messed up, right? I'm going to admit it, I messed up. Uh, but my wife loved the tiramisu so much that she still had more... Uh, she fed herself more even after her bathroom drama. So she would have it in the afternoon, she would have it at night, you know, and she would still go to the bathroom and crave for more tiramisu. So I think my tiramisu did actually succeed to a certain extent, uh, but, you know, my wife has to suffer because of it. She loves it, and yet she has to deal with it. So I think the moral of the story is this, mm -hmm. you know, despite, you know, going with the same ingredients where things are manufactured from, you know, the brand of the ingredients used may play a factor or a role, you know, in terms of the outcome of the end products. The recipe which I took actually came from a Western country, so where they have four seasons and they are they have much drier environment, right? So I, I think it was something that could not be avoided. I did not really know how we can adapt to such conditions, you know, without spending more money to have just that dry environment to bake cakes. So there might be other factors that could have caused the tiramisu to become so soggy to actually cause diarrhea but the thing is I may not know until I try again uh, with another recipe or I try again maybe with longer cooking time. Yeah, so, so the rest of tiramisu uh, will already have been disposed as of this recording going live. So I, I will also humbly just return back to baking my burnt cheesecake once more, right? And still, uh, the burnt cheesecake, I'm uh, very proud and confident that it should still turn out fine. Hopefully, that's still the case. And if anyone wants to know the recipe, please do let me know. And share and subscribe so that there is awareness towards baking cakes or making tiramisu. So that everyone is aware of the effort required to just make this awesomely tasting cakes, right? 
And until next time, take care, and I hope to speak to you soon. Bye-bye.